Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the final event in the Snuggle Up with Spineless series. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed all the engaging content and community interaction uh, while snuggled up at home. Uh, we are finishing the event series strong. So what do we have in store for you tonight? Of course, it is an exciting new literary wonder, uh, fully exploring aspects of these contemporary, unprecedented times uh, that we live in now. While that buzzword has been assaulting our ears uh, for the last couple of years, um, it has been a journey of ups and downs uh, on the individual level and for the states, territories and nations as a whole. Um, so yeah, it's good to explore some of those issues. Before we get stuck into things, I would first like to uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we all live on. Uh, I'm zooming in from Bidjigal land of the Darug Nation. Hazel Smith, our author tonight, uh, and guest speaker Roger Dean are both zooming in from Darul land. And guest speaker Anne Brewster is situated on Ghana land. And Joy Wallace is joining us from Wiradjuri country. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Sovereignty was never ceded. I also invite everyone in the audience to put in the chat the land they are zooming in from as well. Uh, what are we here to talk about tonight? You may have picked up a clue from the event title. Uh, Ecliptical addresses some of these contemporary psychological, ethical and philosophical issues, including family secrets, intentions, private and public creativity, the enigma of time, surveillance, fake news, disease, environmental damage and homelessness. It evokes many iconic topics such as, Ber as the Berlin Wall, uh, COVID-19, Trump and Brexit. The volume extends Hazel Smith's long-standing experimentation with language, genre and other media, and many poems are inspired by music, painting or film. Ecliptical includes prose poetry and short prose, texts that are synesthetic, uh, sonic or linguistic explorations. Uh, surreal excursions and bullet point adventures in which each line unveils a new observation. Other pieces employ non-literary forms or include documentary or remixed elements. Ecliptical also flirts with the post-human in some collaborative computer-assisted poems. Uh, where can you find this eclectic work of poetry? Uh, if you kindly direct your attention to the chat, uh, I will be posting the links where you can find that. So there's a physical copy and there's an ebook as well, if that's your preference. So tonight we will be party to a discussion uh, on and readings by the author behind Ecliptical, as well as some of her guest speakers. Hazel will be doing a reading for us, followed by a talk from Joy, a discussion between Anne and Hazel and a presentation by Roger. So finally, we will open the floor for an audience Q&A for everyone to ask any and all questions they have. You can stick your questions in the chat throughout the night, uh, but we'll probably save answering them until we get to the Q&A section. Uh, you can also keep them on hand and ask them yourself at the end. Just press your raise hand button uh, so that I can unmute you. Now, may I introduce our star of the night, author Hazel Smith. Hazel Smith is a writer, performer, new media artist, and academic. She has published five poetry volumes, including The Erotics of Geography, published by Tim Fish Press in 2008, Word Migrants, published by Giramondo in 2016, and Ecliptical, published by Spineless Wonders in 2022. Uh, she has published two CDs of her performance work, as well as numerous other performance and multimedia works. She has performed, presented, and broadcast her work extensively nationally and internationally and has had several ABC commissions. She is a founding member of the internationally active sound and multimedia ensemble, Australisis. In 2018, with Will Lewis and Roger Dean, she was awarded first place in the Electronic Literature Organization's International Robert Coover Prize. Hazel is Emeritus Professor in the Writing and Society Research Center, at Western Sydney University, and she has authored several academic books, including the most recently, The Contemporary Literature Music Relationship, published by Routledge, uh, Routledge in 2016. And her website is at www.australisis.com. I'll stick that in the chat as well. Um, oh, yes, sorry, Moya, I'm Callan. I'll be your MC tonight. I forgot in my enthusiasm to introduce our <laughs> guest. Um, I'm Callan from Mini Digi Marketing which you can find us on Instagram at Mini Digi Marketing. So I will be hosting and uh, helping out with the tech side of things tonight. Um, so we are dying to hear some of your lovely poems, Hazel. So whenever you are ready, you can 
take it away. I'll just make sure you're the focus. Okay. Can everybody hear me? We can. Yes, you can. Okay. Well, I've never been called a star before, um, Cal, and I'll make sure that I enjoy my 15 minutes of fame. So, okay. Well, before I read a few poems, I'd like to thank everyone for coming and Callum for hosting today. I would like to thank Bronwyn Meehan and the whole Spinous Wonders team for this beautifully produced book and Zaglinda Carl Spence for her evocative image on the front cover. I'd also like to express my gratitude to the collaborators on the audio and multimedia works associated with the book. And in particular, I'd like to warmly thank Anne, Joy and Roger for joining me today and for their long-standing engagement with my work. It's been extremely important to me. As Callan suggested, there are a lot of different types of poems in Ecliptical. Joy is going to talk about some of the more political poems and set them in context. So this evening I have chosen a small selection of poems which constellate loosely around the idea of the intangibility of reality. Reality as ellipsis and eclipse, hence Ecliptical. The first poem, Personhood, A Few Preliminaries, a prose poem, meditates on the elusive business of being human, interwoven with thoughts about the equally elusive process of writing. So, personhood, a few preliminaries. I am not the person I thought I was. I am not the person I sought or ought to be. I am a person with many thoughts, but I prefer not to be about who I am. I do not like to ponder too much. My thoughts are wasps ready to sting. A poem purrs, a poem permits, a poem suddenly vanishes from sight. When I wake in the morning, I struggle not to reflect. I serve thinking, then sink it, but it quickly bobs back again. Sometimes I am certain that I never was. The poem has ice rink, writing as risk, my personhood stalks my body unhinged. Ought does not make an author, does not make autonomy. Sometimes my hood seems rhapsodic and orchestral. I stab the violin and the violin stabs me. Sometimes I am not a person. I am a machine learning to be human. I am not a persona either. I flirt dangerously with earth and worms. I dig through to yearning branches, inquiring trees. A poem pursues, an open purse. A poem perks up, makes swirling patterns in the rubble. Held high on a wet raft of calculations, numbers keep me warm, and intensity steams and smothers. Loss, the birth of the oracular, ought as a violation. The sky narrows. A pink bud, stained and sticky, opens out endlessly, as if reversing a slight. Where are Adam and Eve? They have left us with a lot of gardening to do. Everything is off, uneven, fractious, even thinking. Right, the next one is... The next piece is Partial Eclipse, and it is one of a number of pieces of short poetic prose in the book, which deal with hidden knowledge or unexplained situations. Partial Eclipse. On the night of the partial eclipse, you squinted at the moon, wishing the sky seemed less cloudy. Afterwards, your young friends, Amy and Phil, sat around a table with Michael and you to drink a glass of wine. In the middle of a context you could not later recall, Phil said, as if it was self-explanatory, Amy doesn't get jealous. Amy did not respond, and such a remark did not align with anything you knew about her. You were curious and wondered what he meant. Was he talking about sex? Was he hinting at some hidden aspect of their relationship? Or was he reflecting more broadly Marked by an unasked question, an ellipsis that would expand, the opportunity to inquire was lost. You could not say weeks afterwards. I remember you said that Amy does not get jealous, and I have been wondering what you meant by that. 
I would like to know because the idea that someone is immune from sexual jealousy is unusual. You had to leave the remark in place, stretching and flexing. You will learn to value it because it cannot be further decoded. You will be grateful for all the thoughts it has provoked in you, all the moments of wonder it has provided. Almost, almost, you hope its orbit will not be stilled. Its aura will continue to burn brightly. The next poem, Snow Monkeys, is one of what I call my bullet point poems, where every line is an independent entity, a little world in itself, often disjunct from the lines before or after it. Meanings cut in and out quite abruptly, but rub against each other. A thread, however, that cascades through the poem is, I think, that things are never quite how they seem to be. In this poem, the sound drives the sense, so just go with the flow, don't try to work it all out. Snow monkeys. Do snow monkeys remember the snow when they are taken to the desert? The past often seems unsure of itself, swatting away its own contours. My internal umpire keeps bowling me out with the battered rules I bat by. Afterwards, your whole life shifts, she said. Everything is snatched from resplendence. Hard and soft borders strut their own schedules, sugared forms of entrenchment. Nothing would ever be resolved by the jangle of disabled statistics. He limped through life because one part of his brain was shorter than the other. They erase each other in the street, trading intimacy for oblivion. The politician floated on packaged dancers, but never mopped up the question. She dialed reality on her phone, but it remained locked and listless. There is too much commercialism in the theater, you said, too much playing to the incontinent gallery. The friendship continued to flow downstream, but understanding was dry, discontinuous. As soon as she started talking, he switched to a mode of mock listening. The mangled faces of the war-torn were concealed for public convenience. The early Brits were black-skinned and blue-eyed, not the white squatters of history. Have you ever known a revolution that wasn't also regressive? The film was such a firestorm that joy reversed into embers. A history of suffering so elongated that the end burns out the transitions. <clears throat> the last poem is one which formed the basis for one of the audio collaborations with Roger, John and Carmasea and Brendan Smiley. This is a poem triggered by the idea of memory, not so much specific memories, but the messy, bodily, iterative process of remembering. There is a woman in the poem, and when I read it, I sometimes wonder whether she is a woman immersed in her own memories, or a woman in someone else's memory, or if she's actually memory itself. Maybe she is all three. It's called Headless Reminiscences. She treads on the hem of her own remembering. A snuffed out candle, a swirling dress, uneasy balancing. The brief liaison of cause and effect, the fresh breath of inverted logic a succulent back and forth between underwater voices. He picks her up and then drops her to the ground repeatedly until there is nothing left to understand but ritual. She flips east, she cranes west, her long neck strained but vigilant. She spreads her scarf generously across anarchic sea level. She puts on and takes off the jacket, fumbling with hooks and buttons. The raw and the cooked, dressed up to kill, fighting for position. The arms and legs of headless reminiscences, wrapped in a ruthless longing. A stranger sinks scissors into silk, the whirring sonics of a big saw cutting. You take the camera out, but the bird has flown away. The thunderous applause of non-clapping hands permeates the now. Bubbles rise like agile limbs in the boiling ether, poise amongst the flickering. Thank you very much for listening. Mm. 
it's not it's not good clapping when you're on mute. It doesn't really give the same impact. Um, <laughs> thanks for that, Hazel. Uh, that was a very strong demonstration of your ability to play with language and beautiful compositions. And I think when you said the phrase headless reminiscence, I got tingles down my spine. Um, so that's that was really cool. <laughs> yeah, very much. Um, so up next, we will be hearing from Joy Wallace, who will be uh, taking us through a journey to place cryptical in the context of others, uh, Hazel's other poetry works. So let me just invite her to the stage, as it were. Yeah, there we go. I'll get myself out of the way as well and bring up this one for you. Thanks, Callum. Lovely. Well, sorry, everyone. My voice sounds really boring after Hazel's, wasn't that a fabulous reading? <laughs> well, when I was preparing this brief introduction to Hazel's latest book of poems, I had two soundtracks running through my head. I seemed to have on loop the radio promo for the ABC's The Weekly in the lead up to the recent Australian federal election with its pitch, we watch all the news so you don't have to. Give us an hour and we'll give you the week. And then the morning of Wednesday, the 25th of May, four days after the election, I heard the former Federal Home Affairs Minister, Karen Andrews, interviewed on ABC News Breakfast. Andrews skirted around the question Lisa Miller put to her. Was Julie Bishop right in claiming that the Liberal Party had a lack of empathy with women voters? Not at all was the answer. What the Liberal Party had to do was simply to get back on track with what women wanted. And they could apparently do that without empathy, maybe through a survey, who knows. Well, a trademark of Hazel's poetry since her first volume, abstractly represented in 1991, has been its skill in surveying and reflecting on world events for the reader. Not so much so we don't have to, and of course the weekly pitch humorously plays down the demand for thought from the viewer, but to give us an orientation, a prompt, a perspective on all sorts of events, issues, problems in the world. The source of her ability to do this, I think, is her empathy. In giving us perspectives on political prisoners, on someone trying to make sense of a child's disappearance, on the lives of Holocaust survivors, on women artists condemned to live in the shadow of a male relative, Hazel feels with, not for, a wide range of human beings. Her interest always seems to be in how it's possible to go on being human, a reflective, sentient being, in the face of emotional and intellectual disorientation produced by watching the world. Hazel does this without ever being confessional or sentimental. She marshals a range of speaking voices to offer the reader a purchase on events which might otherwise throw us off balance. Her poetry is always grounded in wide reading and research. There are several works based on real life events in ecliptical and the notes at the end of the book show us the sources Hazel has used to bring authenticity to her reimagining of these real life situations. Hazel's great strength as a poet is her connectedness. Quite often, this takes the form of a collaboration with other artists. Ecliptical includes the fruit of some powerful and productive collaborations. Roger Dean will say more this evening about these works and the processes that produce them. For me though, Hazel's always connected, even if she's not technically working with another artist. For instance, she has a special artistic sympathy with Siglinda Carl Spence, who's with us this evening, and whose beautiful artworks have graced the covers of Hazel's 2016 volume, Word Migrants, and now Ecliptical. Siglinda's works are immensely eloquent, and like Hazel's poetry, enact the creative tension between abstraction and representation, as in this work Becoming, on the cover of Ecliptical, the abstract ideas of journeying, of orbiting great expanses of space, exhilarate and haunt the, view the viewer. At the same time, though, we are anchored in representation of the materiality of the traveller as captured in those eloquent feet. 
The feet are as at once suggestive of the winged features of myth, like Mercury, and of the weary traveller of vast distances coming thankfully to rest. Once we open the book, we'll be urged to put our winged feet on again as Hazel takes us on a journey of empathy and leads us into the worlds of people who are variously disoriented and displaced, people holding on to systems and rituals which enact their continuing identities, even if the processes themselves bring scant comfort. The Lips Are Different text is from a performance and multimedia piece, a collaboration with Roger Dean and Australisis. Details of how to access the piece are in the notes to the the electronic um, version of Ecliptical, a big incentive to get that version. From Hazel's notes, we learn that The Lips Are Different is about the case of Suad Hagi Mohammed, a Somali-born woman who migrated to Canada and became a Canadian citizen. She went to visit relatives in Kenya, but Canadian officials there would not let her board the plane home to Toronto because they said they, she didn't look like her passport photo. In particular, they claimed that the lips are different. Although she gave convincing evidence of her identity, the Canadian authorities would not accept that she was telling the truth and she was unable to return to Canada for several months. Hazel invites us to think about what the experience was like for Mohammed. Have you ever been interrogated in an airport? It doesn't take long before you find that everything you say is incorrect. It's uncanny, but innocence can adopt features more fitting for the guilty. Hazel has a note at the end the matter was only resolved when Mohammed belatedly took a DNA test that proved she was telling the truth. And the poem puts it like this. After months of hardship, barely housed in Nairobi slums, separated from her surrogate homeland, a DNA test proved Mohammed was Mohammed, at least biologically. She said, I thought my government would back me up. I was alone when my government let me down. So in The Lips Are Different, Hazel makes us ponder what tricks racial prejudices play with our senses and what it feels like to be subjected to this hostile and disbelieving gaze, which challenges the woman's very bodily identity and what this does to a person's trust in government. The final vision of the poem is one of abandonment, disorientation and displacement. The Canadian officials had sent her into an unlit world without documentation, without support, without status. The netherworld of fum fumbled transit and only a flashlight for comings and goings. I'd like to finish with a few words about Hazel's volume in the context of Australian literature. It's interesting to consider whether Hazel's poems intersect with the distinctly Australian tradition at all. Hazel was born in Britain into a family of Lithuanian Jewish heritage. She trained and worked as a professional violinist for many years. She migrated to Australia in 1988. In articles I've published on Hazel's earlier work, I've looked to situate her in predominantly European and American traditions, but there are some poems in Ecliptical that I think are significant interventions in Australian cultural traditions. Street People is one of Hazel's prose poems. I really love her prose poems. It's a late intervention in the tradition announced by Judith Wright in Metho Drinker. Published in 1949, Metho Drinker continued a shift in Australian poetry away from the bush verse redolent of Henry Lawson and Banjo Patterson and easy ideas of belonging and mateship. Away from all that to a vision of urban alienation, sickness and friendlessness. But Wright's vision in Metho Drinker is still distinctly romantic and her perspective rather detached from the human being suffering from addiction. By contrast, the speaker in Hazel's poem walks the streets with the homeless 
and acknowledges the privilege of not being of their number. No one knows what to do with the homeless. I've grown fond of some of them since I have the privilege to pick and choose. Sometimes a familiar face goes missing and I wonder if she has passed away. And then there is the child, perhaps my favorite poem in Hazel's new volume. The child rewrites the trope of the missing child familiar in Australian culture, at least since Frederick McCubbin's painting Lost. It's a trope that has often had Gothic overtones of horror and implied criminality, usually with a rural outback setting. After McCubbin, real life examples have still seen the child go missing from some non-urban setting. The most famous is the case of Azaria Chamberlain. And yet, since the disappearance of the Beaumont children from an Adelaide beachside suburb in the 1960s, the sense of pervading vulnerability and danger has spread from the bush to the safety of the urban environment. And this is where Hazel sets her poem, The Child. Hazel's told me that the poem is inspired by the disappearance of the young British girl, Madeleine McCann, and the Australian boy, William Tyrrell. The child enacts what's always been implicit in cases, whether fictional or real, of dead or missing children in Australia since McCubbin's iconic painting, and that's the perspective of the observer. What do we see? What do we hear? What do we believe, fear, suspect, hope? How do we separate the way we respond to an actual case of a dead or missing child from the Gothic mythology and iconography surrounding the figure in Australian visual and written culture? Hazel begins the poem with a set of different perspectives on the disappearance of a child. The child was playing in a garden full of pink camellias and then disappeared. Her grandmother was in, his grandmother was in the kitchen making a cup of tea, opening a tin of biscuits. The child ran away. The child was abducted. The child was murdered. The camellias disappeared from the vase, which then upended itself. The disappearance was a puff of smoke, a figure of eight, an unpeeled apple, flashes on a screen. Disappearance has its own agendas, its own quiet rituals. That last line, disappearance has its own agendas, its own quiet rituals, gets to the heart of the matter. Disappearance is an event in itself, irrespective of the who, what, when and where. Why were we fixated on the case of Azaria Chamberlain? Why can't we let the case of William Tyrrell go? Why do we breathe such a heartfelt sigh of relief when Cleo Smith was found alive? And this is how the poem ends. It was unlikely the parents were murderers, but nothing was impossible. Maybe the child decided to run away, sprout an identity, but isn't that something adults do, not children? Everywhere there were smashed plates and vases. The parents were caring, the parents were lying. The child had asked a question the night before the abduction. Afterwards, they wondered again and again about their inquiry, why it was different from other questions, whether it might pose a solution. There was no body, no trace, no system. Hazel's poem makes us think about the motivations and stimulus for our interest in the case of the missing child. Is our fascination warmly empathic for the child and the family, or more coldly compelled by intrigue and morbid fascination with criminality and scandal? Can we ever accept that loss and death may be random, agentless, the workings of what older societies would call fortune, or are we caught up in a, path a pathology of paranoia? In so many of the poems in Ecliptical, Hazel leaves us with questions like these, the fruits of her restless and profound watching of the world. And now that's enough from me and time to hear from Hazel again, this time in conversation with Anne Brewster. 
Thanks for that, Joy. Uh, as mentioned, we have a conversation uh, between Anne and Hazel. So I will just bring that up for you. Hi, Hazel. I've been reading Ecliptical, um, enjoying it a great deal. And I notice at the beginning of the book, you comment several times that poetry is a kind of marginalised, arcane literary form. And you question somewhat whimsically about whether people actually read poetry or not. And if this is so, why do you write poetry and what does it offer for you? I think what attracts me um, a great deal about poetry is the enigmatic and chameleon uh, qualities of language. Uh, the fact that a word can mean so many different things. It's very exciting to explore and exploit that. And I also love the interweaving of sound and sense that you get in poetry. But there is a lot more to it than that. I think there's something much more fundamental, which is that I feel that poetry is incredibly flexible and mutable. And there's so much that you can do with the form. You can stretch it in so many different ways. And this is something I love to do. So I love to hybridize poetry with prose, with writing for performance, with writing for the screen. I love to bring poetry together with visual images and with music. It just gives me enormous scope to do what I want. And it really suits me because um, I like to have a very kind of varied style of writing. I like to write in a very heterogeneous way rather than a homogenous way. And so poetry really gives me a space to do that. And what about the title of the book, Ecliptical? This evokes ideas of eclipse and ellipsis. And you seem quite interested in the idea of, or the act of not seeing everything. For example, when you talk about personhood, which you do quite a lot, you're very interested in these concepts of incompleteness and disruption. Yes, I, I think we never really do see the whole of anything. We never really have the full story about anything. Um, people often have secrets or they withhold information. Information in its families is sometimes withheld for generations. So we, we're not in control of all the facts about something. We're always wondering a little bit. And I like to uh, present my material like that. I like to present material in a very enigmatic way. I don't want to fill in all the details. Um, and I want to raise questions rather than answering them. I love your idea of aligning the practice of listening with the practice of reading. You're exploring the kind of attention we bring to artistic um, conventions that we're working within. And I love the kind of humour and whimsicality that saturates your work. Can you say something about humour and the kind of work that it does for you? Yeah, I mean, I think what I like about humour is that it's deadly serious. There is a kind of flip side to humour, which means that you can make a very sort of um, very strong social comments uh, in a way which might seem quite laboured if you did it seriously. So I think humour is a wonderful tool. It's not the only tool. I don't want to use it all the time, but I want to be able to call on it in, uh, in certain circumstances. I also think that poetry, uh, that humour is very subversive and it gets you away from that whole lyric tradition and all the baggage that comes with it. And I enormously um, admire poets like uh, Joanne Burns here in Australia or Matt Welton in the UK or Charles Bernstein in the US who use humour. But those poets are very serious poets. They're really making comments about uh, contemporary society and uh, using humour to do it. I was also going to ask you about your sort of reappraisals of historical women arts practitioners from all different kinds of fields like Fanny Mendelssohn, Lee Israel and Lee Krasner. Could you say something about the um, importance of this practice of um, kind of 
reinventing or rereading these women and why is this important to you as a woman and as a poet yeah well i'm interested particularly in uh, lee krasner and fanny mendelssohn because they were so overshadowed by their male counterparts i mean lee krasner is a great painter but she was married to jackson pollock <laughs> and he is also a great painter uh, but you know he just totally overshadowed her and her reputation and it's only now uh, that people are realizing just what a wonderful painter Lee Krasner is so I'm interested in that um, I'm also was very interested with Fanny Mendelssohn uh, because she you know was born in the 19th century and she really just didn't have the opportunities for public exposure and public performance that her brother Felix had um, and I think that we really need to think about this and it's a way of exposing sexism which has been rife through the ages as you know and which still continues there are still many people who think that men can do things better than women so we really need to fight it and exploring it in my poetry is one way of doing that. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to ask you about uh, your family's diasporic Jewish history, which is um, informs this book in a kind of, um, you know, subtle way, often elliptical. I see this in the book's thematics, for example, on migration, displacement and intersectionality it seems to me as though this kind of heritage makes you sensitive to a wide range of issues relating to political violence, intergenerational trauma in all sorts of different historical and contemporary contexts. Yes, that's a very big meaty question. Mm -hmm. I, um, I, obviously my Jewish upbringing uh, was very, very important in making me the person I am and making the right, me the writer I am. Uh -huh. And it's important because I both embraced my Jewish identity and many ways, many times I also pulled away from it. So I have this quite complex relationship to it. So as a writer, I do want to talk about Jewish suffering, for instance, but I do want to connect that up with other types of suffering, other people who are suffering around the world. And I see myself as a very kind of cosmopolitan kind of writer um, and I have lived in different places and I have traveled quite a lot and I'm very interested in thinking about things that are going on around the world. I do agree with you that um, the Jewish background is one of the reasons why I'm interested in political violence and transgenerational trauma but I just want to say that I think when I look at my uh, own writing, I think a theme that comes through a huge amount, uh, which is connected with that, is repression. Mm. Uh, repression at a personal level, at a domestic level, at a family level, also repression at an institutional level or in, at a national level or an international level. And I... Um, yeah, I think that's one of the ways in which my Jewish background impacts on my writing. And I think that it's, uh, there are a lot of images in my writing of, you know, closed in spaces, people trapped in situations, and that this is all uh, related. It's interesting that you talk about yourself as a cosmopolitan, because I would have thought to you, I would have thought, as I've said to you before, that, you know, a lot of Jewish history is precisely very cosmopolitan because of diaspora and because of movement from place to place over generations. Yes, I, that, that was quite common. Yes, yes, mm. I agree. Yes. Um, I also wanted to ask you about your, um, your other life as a professional violinist. Um, and I've noticed over the the, the trajectory of your many books that you've talked to, that the, there have been frequent references to the violin. Um, for example, in the poem Personhood, you say, I stab the violin and the violin stabs me. So I was really interested in the kind of visceral 
intrusion of the violin into the work there. And I wanted to ask you, does the specific act, initially I wanted to ask you, does the specific act of actually playing the violin, do you think that informs your poetry and also, I guess, just music in, in general? Well, uh, violin, playing the violin or playing any musical instrument is extremely sensuous. Um, it really is. And um, I think um, it's connected perhaps with my interest in the kind of sensuous qualities of words. Um, I, now that I don't play the violin, <laughs> I enjoy the sensuous quality of words. But um, I think obviously being a musician and being a violinist has impacted hugely on my, the way that I write. Um, my writing is quite performative in places, not all of it, but quite a lot of it is performative. I do write for performance. I, I write works uh, with musicians. So um, it's had a big impact that way. But it, at a more fundamental level, I think I'm so interested in sound and the sounds of the words and the way that they behave. And I use sound to generate material often rather than semantics. Um, mm. Uh -huh. And I'm also very, very interested in structure, which I think also comes from my interest in music. So I think music has influenced me more than I can say, really, um, in my life as a musician. I can't imagine what my writing would have been like if I hadn't been a mm. musician. Yeah, yes. And I wanted to ask you also about the tropes and the imagery of machinery in this book. At one point, point uh, the narrator says I am a machine learning to be human and I wonder what this actually means you talk about the interface of the human and the machine with humor and quirkiness and you constantly suggest the idea of collision as well as uh, connection yes I mean I can't remember exactly what was in my mind when I wrote that that's so often the case that you can't really remember <laughs> Well, you wrote something. But <laughs> I was thinking of um, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning and the fact that our lives are becoming more and more merged um, with, com with wow. computers. People are becoming more and more merged with computers. Um, and, you know, we really, in, in the not so distant future, we, robots really will be trying to learn how to be human they already are to some degree um i think there's a couple of other things i'd like to say about that that phrase in that poem and that is that one tends to assume in that poem personhood that the narrator is a person and mm -hmm. it's about personhood but maybe the narrator could be a machine mm -hmm. to be human yes. um, so that would be another interpretation of it mm -hmm. and, um the other thing I'd like to say is that um, maybe also what was somewhat in my mind, or I can read that into it now, is that it's very important that we not only learn to be human, but that we learn to be more humane. Mm -hmm. um, can I ask you just to finish off, if you can say a little bit more about your computer generated poetry and about this particular poesis um, in this book? I know this is a huge topic. Um, yes. Yeah. But... Well, um, I think the reason why I was attracted to while I'm why I'm attracted to the text generation, which is at the basis of some of the the computer based text generation, which is at the basis of some of these poems, is um, to get away from you know habitual modes of thinking, get away from your own mind a bit. Obviously, the computer thinks very differently from how I think. Um, it's it's great to explore your own mind, but there are kind of limits to it and it's nice sometimes to get away from it. So I think that's what attracted me about it. It was Roger who will be speaking later who did the text generation, I didn't do that. And what happens, he, learned, he used machine learning to do that. And what happens in machine learning is that the machine is given a huge amount of material to learn, what we call a corpus, and it, learns the kind of structure of that text, the structure of the material, and it uses that knowledge, that information to generate new text. 
Now that's just hugely simplifying it. And if anybody in the Q&A wants to ask Roger more details about that, uh, he can give more details about the process. But then what happens is that Roger gives me that material and I have to decide what to do with it. And what I did in the book, there are only four poems like that. What I did was with one poem, I left the material almost as it had come out from the computer, from the machine learning process. And I must say that in some ways that is the most interesting one because it's the most bizarre one. And then um, with another one, I left it partly as it had come out and added a few words. And in two other ones, I transformed the text very considerably from the text generation. Mm. But I think what I feel about those poems is that they are all different from the other poems in the volume. There is a kind of contrast uh, with the other poems. And I like that. And I like the fact that it gives variety to the volume. Thanks, Hazel. Thank you. There's so much there to think about, especially um, in the kind of your interaction with the with the, the computer generated text that I find that so interesting. I'm sure there's lots of questions and people probably have their own questions which will come into their mind as they read your book and enjoy it. It throws out so many challenges and so many enticements. Thank so you. congratulations on such a wonderful book, Hazel. Thank you. And thank you, Anne, for such uh, very perceptive questions. I really enjoyed. My pleasure. Thank you. Yes, Hazel, you were, you were very ahead of the time in that um, only the last couple of days there's been that controversy over the Google um, AI sentience uh, over that. Um, and I think I also recently saw um, something about, it was like a, a, someone had asked an AI program to write a, a stand-up comedy special. Um, and it turns out like, they get pretty close to writing a decent one if you feed it enough um, input material. So yeah, that's um, really something to think about. Yes, uh, a lot of people are scared of the um, Google Google situation. Um, so that was a conversation with Anne Brewster, who is an honorary associate professor based at the University of New South Wales. Um, her research interests include Australian Indigenous literatures, women's literatures, minoritised women's literatures, critical race and whiteness studies, violence studies, cross-racial research methodologies, and explorative critical writing methodologies. Uh, so her books include Giving This Country a Memory, uh, Contemporary Aboriginal Voices of Australia, published in 2015, uh, Literary Formations, Postcoloniality, Nationalism and Globalism uh, from 1996, Reading Aboriginal Women's Autobiography uh, Towards a Semiotic of Postcolonial Discourse uh, and the, from the University Writing in Singapore and Malaysia uh, and Notes on Catherine Lim's Little Ironies, Stories of Singapore with Kerpal Singh in 1987. She co-edited with Angeline O'Neill and Rosemary Van, Vanderberg, Van Danberg uh, an anthology of Australian Indigenous writing, Those Who Remain Will Always Remember uh, and the research for her recent book, Rethinking the Victim, Gender, Violence and Contemporary Australian Women's Writing with Sue Cosso, um, has been supported by the Australian Research Council. So Anne Brewster is also the series editor for Australian Studies, uh, the Interdisciplinary Perspectives, are published by Peter Lang. I don't know how you have all the time for that, and that's a serious uh, academic range. Um, so... You also heard uh, a couple of mentions from the other talks that have happened about Hazel's predilection for using multimedia forms to try and capture the full freedom and versatility with how she thinks um, about language into a poetic form that can express those ideas. Uh, you may also be wondering how that's done. Uh, we heard a little bit about that with the machine learning uh, programs. Um, how it works and what does it mean to experience a poem or text that really plays within the expanded limits offered by multimedia um, when you move away from the limitations of your own brain. Uh, thankfully, Roger Dean is here to answer those questions and give us something like a behind the scenes taste of what goes into producing a work like that and the collaborative audio and multimedia works which are associated with Ecliptical. 
So Roger Dean is a composer and improviser, and since 2007, a research professor in music, cognition, and computation at the Marx Institute, uh, which is in Western Sydney University. His research folds into his creative work, notably through deep learning computational models. He directs the creative ensemble Australisis, uh, which has appeared in 30 countries. With Will Lewis and Hazel Smith, he received the Robert Coover Prize of the Electronic Literature Organization in 2018. He has performed as a bassist, a pianist, and a computer artist in many contexts, from the Academy of Ancient Music and the Australian Chamber Orchestra to the London Symphonietta, and from Graham Collier Music to duets with Derek Bailey and Evan Parker. About 70 commercial recordings and numerous radio and online digital intermedia pieces represent his creative work and more than 300 journal articles elucidate his research. His current research concerns improvisation, roles of acoustic intensity and timbre and rhythm generation and perception. Previously, he was a full professor of biochemistry in the UK, foundation CEO and director of the Heart Research Research Institute in Sydney, and then Vice Chancellor and President of the Uni University of Canberra. Um, so we will hear from him now, Roger, if you would like to start your presentation. Yeah, thank you. So thanks for mentioning the, the case of the Google naive employee who thought that their, their Lambda, which is a machine learned conversational bot, that it was a human, uh, it just illustrates that if you ask a person uh, whether they think a sound is speech or not, they're quite likely to say it is speech, whether or not it is. If you ask a machine whether it's sentient, and if so, how, it'll tell you it is and how it is. Uh, he was incredibly naive to go that way, but at the same time, machine learning is very interesting from the point of view of text generation, and Hazel and I have been very interested in using it quite a few different ways. Um, not only machine learning, but also algorithmic processes. The distinction being that, as Hazel mentioned, machine learning is to do with a machine working out the structure of a corpus of stuff, whereas algorithmic processes are ones where one conceives a mechanism of transformation. So I'm not going to take talk more about those computational things, but I might mention that in an article Hazel wrote about Charles Bernstein's dialogic discursive methods, there's a very, uh, what I consider a very racy piece of computational writing, which we did, which is quite energetic and pretty far out, I think. Anyway, my brief now is to talk about sound, which again, you've heard Hazel's been deeply involved with in many ways. And I'm also going to talk briefly about the process of uh, collaboration. So let me share my system and let you hear something. Uh, there's nothing to see in this first one, but if you've got your options in the audio system set up to uh, original audio, you should hear what I'm going to play in a minute in stereo. What I'm going to play is a, a little bit of a piece called um, Scaling the Voices, which is related to the poem in the book called Fractals. So fractality, you might well be aware, is about having similar structures at multiple scales within an object. So this could be a musical object, it could be a physical object. And in this case, I'm gonna play you a couple of excerpts from this piece. We, we've done a variety of means of transforming voice sounds into musical sounds and vice versa. They're actually very different in origin, but you can make them overlap. You can make a voice cross gender. There's all sorts of things. So let me just play you a little bit, which uh, will illustrate scale, and then I'll show you a couple of further excerpts before we go on. As I say, nothing to see here at the moment. Just have a listen. Thank <laughs> you. 
At the time, my wishes were so microscopic that only strangers could taste them. The rain was short-breathed, and everything was drenched in sheets of speculation. At the time, my wishes were so microscopic that only strangers could taste them. So, actually, quite simple manipulations there. But in the next excerpt I'm going to play you, there's scaling in a different sense. The vocal tract is quite a, a unique object which has so many asymmetries that it allows incredible transitions to occur within a very short space of time in speech. And so what I've used in this piece, um, fairly unusually I think, is a computational model of the vocal tract which was then jigged if you like i changed some of the parameters so as to make some of the transformations so they're not quite the normal transformations which a digital sound artist would automatically think of making they're ones much more specific to speech And you could hear the introduction of quite a few other sonic elements there. Just to finish and give you a bit of a final impression of this piece, um, this is the ending section where there's more of a collage of vocal and other wind instruments. So of course wind instruments have certain things in common with the voice and therefore with speech, which they don't necessarily share with other musical sources. And I've used several aspects of that to make this final section. Now let me turn to the, the broader subject of collaboration within multimedia, as you could call that a bimedia that we've just been listening to. And so I want to just say something about a, a piece which is actually not directly to do with the book, but I think is a good example of Hazel's interest in multimedia. This is going to be an excerpt of a piece called Dolphins in the Reservoir, which has just been released for the first time in a conference in Italy last month. Um, and it's a piece by her, myself, doing sound, uh, and Will Lewis, who's been mentioned already, doing image, and also uh, coding most of the montage, both of the text and of the image, while I coded the progress of the sound. So it's an interactive and recombinant work that employs those three elements, image, text, and sound. 
and in a crude sense it confronts the many challenges we face in terms of climate, disease, authoritarianism, technological change and it envisages a post-COVID post -COVID emergence, societal but possibly dystopian as well as utopian. So I'm going to show you uh, a video recording of me playing the piece for myself in the way that a user would and it will show you two sections of cycles which are intendedly uh, numerous. We hope a, a viewer might watch a dozen of them or so. The music is fairly dense in this and it gets denser. The texts are composed, recombined, juxtaposed and the process of this piece was that Hazel wrote a whole lot of text and structured it into topics and things which could be sequenced and then we agreed on a method of sequencing randomly selecting within choices for each sequence for each section and recombining and on the other hand we also agreed that the music would not be subject to those processes it was it's combined in other ways and whereas the user who chooses to click rather than just let it auto run that user influences the speed and the position and the playing of both the text and the sound and the objects the images they don't have any influence on the sound so it's it's quite a, um, a multi-layered piece the text in the very large boxes of which you'll just see two are all somewhat related to dolphins and their implications and they form a kind of contrast a pointer against and with sometimes the ideas in the smaller boxes which are more pithy uh, and succinct. The music by the way has three different components so they're overlaid and they're transformed there's another layer of transformation beyond what you're going to hear you will just hear a little bit of fantastic trumpet playing from John Wallace uh, a very eminent trumpet player um, which was made for a piece which was actually the source of the material here and became a new piece meta, meta conversely we have another fantastic trumpet player and soprano trombone player in the audience so at least one person is going to enjoy this bit i think here we go
So thank you very much. Uh, thanks for being here and thanks for the chance to tell you a little bit about those processes. Thanks for that, Roger. Um, I thought the, the audio piece in particular um, really, it was a cinematic experience even though there were no images because I was like, I was just picturing what was happening and it was, I was getting a lot of mythological um, sort of images in my brain. Um, I think the water splashing and stuff and the sort of, um, it was like someone was talking underwater. For some reason I was picturing something like Hercules diving into the, the <laughs> river Styx or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah. The, all the souls going past, yeah, it was... Yeah. There's some, really cool. some sounds that seem a bit like uh, medieval cowherds. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, and the and the church bells. Yeah. Um, so we've we've come to the part of the evening where you now get to you, the audience, uh, now get to direct your burning questions um, towards the guest speakers tonight. And I don't know if you remember the one of the common threads between our speakers tonight, and that is, with the exception of myself, uh, they're all highly educated and much involved with linguistics and meaning behind sounds and words. Uh, and I think you can't get a more interesting captive panel than that. Uh, so if you have any questions for any of our guests, feel free to type those in the chat or at the bottom of your Zoom call, there will be a control panel. You'll have the reactions button. You can click on that and then there's a click the raise hand button uh, if you want to grab my attention and then I'll unmute you if you feel like asking the question vocally. Um, so. I will be awarding a free copy of the ebook of Ecliptical to the three most interesting questions. So now that you know that we're dealing with high stakes here, uh, you can fire away. Um, and I also think that I may possibly have forgotten to introduce Joy before her segment. So I will quickly do that. Um, so Joy Wallace teaches and researches in the Faculty of Arts and Education at Charles, Start Uni Charles Sturt University in Bathurst. Um, she was Associate Dean of Learning and Teaching for seven years and a member of an OLT funded project on designing first year humanities and social sciences curricula in the context of discipline threshold standards. Joy's long standing interest in Hazel Smith's work, dating from their time as colleagues at the University of New South Wales, has produced several articles. Her other current research with John O'Carroll is on the engaged writing of Australian women writers of the 1940s and 50s, particularly Judith Wright and Eleanor Dark. Um, so yes, it is it is Q and A time. Um, so whenever you pe audience members are happy to start firing questions away, remember the the high stakes on the line. You could win a copy of the ebook of Ecliptical. Meanwhile, I'll just comment that uh, in the chat, Robin Young has mentioned Lachlan Brown as playing with computer generated poetry and posting it on. Facebook. There's actually a very long tradition of computer generated poetry and John Tranter in, in Australia did some interesting stuff with it. And Jarvi, David Johnson, who's written a book on IT Press, did a huge amount of it, published a, a book of machine learned poetry every month for a year. So there's a lot of stuff going on in that field. Yeah, um, Torbjorn has asked in the chat, well, th thank you Hazel, I hugely enjoy reading and rereading your new book. I find them inspiring and musical. I am mainly drawn to the abstract in my own work with words and music. You are sometimes abstract in your writing, sometimes much more direct. Do you have any comments on how you prefer to use these two approaches, if this is how you see it? And do you see any particular style more easily used in musical performance? Wow, wow. Uh, yeah. Corbyn's a fantastic um, trumpeter, trumpeter and it's wonderful to have him with us um, here this evening. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm interested in writing in a quite sort of concrete way and writing in a quite abstract way. I don't think, and I'm just sort of interested in exploring that continuum between the two, you know, from quite concrete into um, more abstract. I often feel that I have to write quite abstractly to um, get at some, some sort of subterranean thoughts and feelings. It's somehow you have to write quite obliquely to get there. So something like that poem, Headless Reminiscences, that I, that I, um, that I read, I felt that I could only 
get to these kind of subterranean feelings through being a bit more abstract and not being absolutely uh, direct. Um, so I probably tend more towards the abstract, but I also do have sometimes it's quite uh, direct and uh, sometimes humour as well. I, I think that hasn't really been represented this, very much this evening, but uh, there are some quite humorous poems. Um, do you see any particular style more easily used in musical performance? I think probably uh, the more abstract ones go better with the musical performance, but um, sometimes uh, I have done sort of storytelling, um, you know, have done storytelling with uh, in musical performance. The Lips of Difference, which Joy talked about, and is quite concrete in many ways. Um, and tells a story and is narrative. So, yeah, I think you can. I think you can explore a range of material all the time. It's a big question, though, Torby, and I, we'll discuss that when we're in A. We'll discuss it in more detail. Um, so, if a picture paints a thousand words, how much? How many words does music sort of add? Uh, if, if, all right. Well, a huge amount. I mean, music is the most incredible thing. I think, you know, often what I'm trying to do in my, thanks for bringing that up, Callum, because I think often what I'm trying to do in my writing is kind of imitate the kind of meaning that you get in music. And it's something, I'm always sort of interested in that thing of what you can't really verbalize, what you can't really put in words. Um, and uh, music is really all about that. Um. You just made me think of something. If anyone's watched Bo Burnham's Inside while they were locked down in COVID, uh, COVID within their own homes, um, it's a stand-up special on Netflix that he like shot, produced, filmed, did everything for uh, while he was in lockdown in the US. Um, and he's quite a musical comedian. He uses a lot of sounds. And there's a couple of um, songs. There was one where he used um i think he pitch shifted his voice so he had quite a deep voice and he was singing about um sort of the need for creatives to have attention on themselves um i think and also like his his grappling with panic attacks that he had on stage um pre-covid and someone pitch shifted back like they transposed it back to his original voice and it's so powerful like the difference in meaning you take away from the two songs even with just a change in pitch yeah. so yeah that may, that's something i'll show you, uh, i'll send you a link for later so you could look at that yeah, but that's... louise louise has asked um wonderful poems they spoke to me especially the first one hazel and so very well read uh roger's multimedia piece was engrossing and very powerful visually beautiful too thank you very much uh, not a question <laughs> just a, just a thank you for the for the fascinating presentations um oh yeah uh, one about the ecliptic no, yeah no. so stephen asked the ecliptic does have a whiff of urn mally uh and a period of contest in australian letters and of course visual arts illustrated by nolan hazel were you channeling the great urn that's very interesting um chris arnold who's here with us uh this this evening um pointed out to me that uh urn mally's collected poems are actually called the darkening ecliptic and um i mean i've you know, read quite a lot of Ern Malley and I certainly know all about it, but I hadn't really passed through my mind that um, if, I, if I ever knew that that was the title of the volume, I certainly wasn't focusing on that. However, when I went back to look at the volume, I thought there's such a big connection here actually with Ern Malley. Um And there's even a poem on faking uh, writing, uh, which fits so beautifully with it that um, I was very, very pleased to have that pointed out and it, I think it really does add another dimension to the whole idea of, um, of, of the epictical. So wonderful, yeah. Uh, next up, Matt has asked, um, what does the process of your poem making look like? How, for instance, do you write your bullet point poems periodically or does it all emerge in a continuous sitting? Well, that's a huge question. It's Again, it's a, a wonderful question, but um, I, write, I do write a lot in fragments, um, you know, bits of things. Those billet point, point poems were very much bits and pieces which I pulled together. Um, I do that, do, do that a lot. Sometimes I get kind of flow going um, and I just, the, head, the Headless Reminiscences poem, I think had a certain amount of uh, flow going through it. Although again, there were, I was assembling bits and pieces, but I work a lot in fragments and um, I, you know, 
put things together and think, does that seem quite right? And I often just write down phrases and then pull things together. And that's somehow how I feel I can really extend the meaning quite a bit. So, yeah, yeah. I think... Uh, you say, does it all emerge in a continuous sitting? No, not, 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 not at all. Not at all. It, it can go on for days and days and days. Um, I once went to, we, well, both Roger and I went to visit the studio of Alan Davy, who is a wonderful painter in, um, Scottish painter who's now no longer alive. And uh, he, it was very interesting to see all his paintings up on the wall and he would go around and just sort of add a little brush stroke here and one, and this, and, and, and a brush stroke here. And this would go on for years, <laughs> these paintings would up there. And he'd just have all these paintings up and add bits and pieces. So yeah, I, I, it takes me quite a while. Hmm. Uh, I think Beth has asked a similar question. Um, so yeah, do you do you write one at a time or write many at once over time? Yes. So I do a bit of both, really. A, a lot of fragments, but also sometimes I just get it into a flow and I write a lot. Yeah. Um, a question for Roger from from me. Um, with the machine learning, is that exclusively a text thing, or is there something you can do with like? feeding it sort of audio inputs and it can write a song for you or something like that? Is that something you work with? Yeah, um, there's quite a lot of work going on trying to do that for commercial purposes and I have a an ARC, Australian Research Council project, where I'm trying to do it for, for my own purposes really, for, for adventurous music making and I've chosen to do it with um, symbolic music, meaning music that can be each individual event of which can be described like like in a MIDI code which can drive a, an electronic instrument. That's a choice which is just to do with simplifying and wanting to be able to get the maximum amount of a, a minimum, a small amount of material. Because the main way of doing it really is to take a huge amount of stuff, you know, say everything on Spotify, and then uh, codify it through the machine learning and, and then generate some more. But that generates more of what is already there mm. in a large degree, whereas I'm trying to generate more of what is not there. So it's very interesting, yeah. Um, so I think Helen has said thanks for the wonderful event. So unfortunately, she has to leave. I'm not sure what time it is in Hong Kong, but yeah, that's that's understandable. Um, any other questions? There's. Joy and Anne are both ready to answer questions as well, if you have anything about their work or their take on Hazel's work. I think, um, Joy, you focus quite on the political side of things. Um, is that more... Because you're involved with sort of social sciences and humanities, is that how you got involved with the political analysis of Hazel's work or is it um, is that something that grabbed you about it? Um, well I think I've always been interested in the ethical aspects of, of Hazel's writing I mean I have published something uh, called the ethics of words and music in her, in her poetry I've always been interested in um, I suppose the, the, the ethical side of of politics, and uh, just thinking of um, the point that I mean, the ancient Greeks, ethics and politics were <laughs> just part of each other, you know, and it, it's only much more recently that they've tended to stretch apart. And the thing I love about Hazel's take on the world is that she just fuses, um, you know, fuses a political and ethical vision. So, um, I mean, we can call it one or the other, but I think it's just a very, um, a very, it's just a very powerful, and I call it a take, and I mean that in a, quite an active sense. Hazel really, to me, just really kind of grabs something uh, out of, out of events and um, you know just turns a fairly a really fierce kind of line of vision on them and elucidates a position you know that that, that the reader can take 
yeah, like a, a snapshot that mm. sort of places you within within the mm. context, I suppose. Um, Sue asks, hi, Hazel and Roger, it's often said that poetry and breath are intricately linked, uh, especially in performance. So how does computer generated sound or music uh, relate to or try to replicate breath and rhythm? I think you better answer that one, Roger. So it's quite a hard, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a very interesting question. It's quite a hard one. I think because you're doing yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a, th a really tricky question, Sue. Um, I was alluding to the fact that, that prosody in speech has a very different set of rhythmic structures from those in most music. So, I mean, there are several ways that one can relate the two, one of which is to take the rhythmic pattern of the intensity, the loudness profile of speech, and put it on top of uh, otherwise musical sound. And then one can do the opposite to a limited degree. I mean, because, because speech has such a rapid flux, it's more difficult to do the opposite thing. That is to take a musical rhythm and put, a, put it on top of it, at least to do it successfully and make it obvious or apparent. But it can be done, and I have done that on occasion with what I thought was moderate success. So there are technical means, uh, and I agree with you that the connection is, is very strong and very interesting in, in the way they produce response, produce meaning. Do you, do you get a uncanny valley sort of effect from trying to replicate um, voices with machines? Oh yes, if you yes, I actually did a, some experiments with Freya Bales, a long-standing colleague of mine, where we tried to. Uh, this is why I referred to if you ask a human whether they can hear some speech in something they're listening to, they're quite likely to say yes. We did an experiment where we generated. Uh, synthetic speech, so no no prior material, purely uh, sound synthesis. And then we had intermediate kind of stuff, which was somewhat transformed speech or somewhat transformed musical sounds intended to hit people it was speech. And then we had genuine speech. And we had people evaluate whether or to what degree they thought there were speech sounds, etc. And yes, you, you, can, you, you can persuade people especially when they're tuned into the idea of listening for it, that it's there. Yeah, is that is that part of the, if anyone can cast their minds back to the Yanni Laurel um, video that went around? So some people would hear one sound, some people would hear a different one. Yeah, and just, I, I think that's true. And, and just to wrap up, I didn't really respond to your proper question. Is there an uncanny valley? I think the uncanny valley is really primarily to do with visual objects but it can be visual in conjunction with sound i don't think I, I don't think anybody's really tried to test it scientifically empirically and i've never really sensed an uncanny valley in sound per se okay so yeah that make that makes sense i was wondering if you uh i don't know now i'm picturing the script of a horror movie uh where you're hearing voices that aren't there yeah. Um, okay, I think, uh, ah, so Uncanny Valley is where something is close enough to human that it's clearly got a lot of attributes of, like, a human face, uh, and movement and stuff, but it's just, like, it's something is not quite right, and it really, when it gets close enough, um, that it is just short of resembling a proper human, then it completely freaks your brain out and you get very uncomfortable looking at it. Um, uh, possibly, I, I don't know the Freudian um, uh, psychoanalysis theory of uncanny, but I just know like as a, as a general sort of stuff I know from the internet, looking at uncanny valley, yeah, it makes you very uncomfortable. Um, Torbjorn... I, I don't know the Freudian concept terribly well myself either, but I think it's a little bit different, Tony. I'm not sure. Chris says, yes, same sense as Freud's essay. Okay, well, it's good that, good that someone's read it. Um, Hazel, you mentioned that you like to stretch and approach poetry from many directions. Do you think it is acceptable for someone else to transform your poems into something quite different, maybe in connection with picture or sound? Yes, I do. Um, I love anybody to do anything with my work. The uh, UNSW uh, 
um, students orchestra, that's University of New South Wales for you, Torbjorn. Um, they um, took my poem Plague and did all sorts of interesting things with it, made great sounds and great images. I love anybody doing that. And if you want to do that, Torbjorn, um, just go ahead. <laughs> Okay, uh, is that a new one? Okay, no, Torbjorn's very thankful for that. Um, okay, is there any more questions? We're about to come up to the sort of 7.30 mark, which signals the end of the event. Um, so I might just do sort of closing statements if no one else has got any questions. No, I think I think that's it. Um, so for the people who sort of win a book, um, I think Torbjorn, you asked a really interesting one to start with um, on sort of style and how that, whether that affects how you work with musical performance. Um, and then Matt Hines is a good had a good question about the process of creating your works because um, your your work is quite unique in that I haven't really encountered poetry that works within the same um, mediums as yours Hazel so yeah I was really interested to hear about your poetry process um, and then also so it was Torbjorn, Matt and then Sue asked a really complicated question about replicating breath in and rhythm with uh, computer generated sound so if you three would like to uh, send me a message with your preferred contact email um, I can pass those on so that we can send you your ebook copy uh, other than that um, thanks for your engagement tonight everyone it was good to see uh, people asking questions and making comments um, and we had a really good turnout tonight which was great it's really encouraging to see how much interest there is in being able to cuddle up wherever it's comfortable and spend a cold winter's evening inside listening and learning about some of the great Australian writing that's available. So that concludes our Snuggle Up with Spineless series. Uh, I hope you enjoyed hearing about some of the works that are now available, including tonight's author's Hazel's uh, new book, Ecliptical. So again, if you want to grab yourselves a copy, uh, whether physical or ebook, uh, I'll stick those links in the chat for you again. There's that one, the physical and the ebook. Um, so, also thanks so much to Spineless Wonders for organising these great events, um, and in particular Bronwyn and Rebecca who organised this one in particular. Um, and thanks to our guests tonight, Hazel, Joy, Anne and Roger for their wonderful insight and I hope everybody enjoyed the evening uh, and our previous Snuggle Up with Spineless events if you made them to those. Uh, I've been your host, Callan, from Mini Digi Marketing. You can find us on Instagram at Mini Digi Marketing. Um, and I guess we'll see you at the next Spineless Wonders event. 